guest today on the Pfefferon Power Podcast is James DaCosta, and that's spelled D-A-C-O-S-T-A, in case you were confused about that. I met James when he was a student in my Pass the Power class, where he was an exceptionally interesting human being. Um, James, I think, has pursued a very, very interesting and unique career. First of all, even though he's relatively young, he's written a book called Fintech Wars, Tech Titans, Chaotic Crypto, and the Future of Money, um, which is, I think, just come out or is just coming out. Um, so he's done a, a book, which is, I think, quite interesting. He has achieved many awards that I tell my students to achieve, but he achieved them before he even took the class. He was in Forbes 30 Under 30. He's recently won this award called Upstart from the, from the Best in British Tech Award in 2023. Um, so he has won many awards. He's built a brand, um, uh, he's built a very strong brand, built a very strong media presence, and he has in fact put into practice the seven rules of power, I think even before he used them. Anyway, welcome to the Pfefferon Power Podcast, James. It is uh, such a pleasure to be here, and I'm uh, very excited for the conversation ahead. Thank you. So why don't you tell people a little bit about your background, how you uh, finally arrived at Stanford, what you did before, a, a little trajectory of how you grew up, something so that people can understand who you are and how you've gotten here. Absolutely. Um, and I, I would say for me, it's a, it's a non-linear path, and, and that's kind of maybe reflective a little bit on kind of who I am as a person, my interests, and my background um, as well. Um, but I grew up in a city in the north of England called Sheffield. And if you listen very closely, you can probably still hear my twang. Um, and, you know, Sheffield is famous for steel about 50 years ago. And uh, people from Sheffield sound a little bit like Jon Snow out of uh, Game of Thrones. Um, so my somewhat claim to fame, it's in the north of England. Um, my dad is Indian. My mom is English. Uh, I have a Portuguese surname. And then the Indian side of my family comes from Kenya. So a little bit global in nature. But I grew up in sort of a post-industrial city in the UK. Fast forward, I studied economics at university. Um, I have always been trying to do startups as a student in school at university. Most of them did not go anywhere. And so I ended up taking um, a, a great job at McKinsey uh, when I graduated and, and stayed there until I became a manager. After that, um, I launched my own uh, digital banking uh, startup called Fingo that provided uh, bank accounts and savings accounts and investment accounts for uh, young um, uh, students and professionals in East Africa. And we did a uh, uh, the Y Combinator Accelerator, um, uh, which was my first link to Silicon Valley. Uh, and fast forward again, I uh, found myself at Stanford uh, Graduate School of Business, uh, where I was lucky enough to uh, learn, learn actually a lot of things from you and uh, kind of tie together some of the, the different pieces I've had in my career. All right. Um, so you had this startup. Uh, my suspicion is the startup is actually quite successful. What caused you to leave it? Oh, good. Um, good question. I wasn't expecting that one. I mean, with with the startup, we, um, you know, I really enjoyed the beginning part. So, uh, we, you know, we're a group of uh, four friends. My three co-founders are uh, Kenyan. And we really went through the, you know, the zero to one um, phase. So we, you know, we built the bank. We got um, regulation from the Central Bank of Kenya. We managed to launch our bank with the president of uh, Kenya, which is, I think, one of the more unique experiences that I've had. And then we scaled to um, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of users, around 150,000 today. And I think I really enjoyed that beginning part um, of the journey. And having done that, kind of wanted to spread my wings and um, and kind of try, try something else. And in fact, that's what even platformed me into uh, kind of getting very excited about other people's startup stories and writing my book. Okay. And um, I believe... It is true that when you graduated from Stanford, you got a job at a very, very prestigious VC firm, and you entered as a partner. Is that true? So, yeah, I'm, I'm not a general partner, but I'm uh, joining uh, Andreessen Horowitz as a uh, partner in their kind of B2B and, and fintech team and investing in early stage, um, early stage startups uh, that I tried to start myself. Yeah, okay. And so can you explain to our listeners, 
how you were able to start. And, you know, I mean, many people out of business school uh, do not start at that rank. Uh, they start as a as, as something lower than that. How are you able to um, how are you able to get such a good job? Well, I, I think um, for me, uh, the kind of um, in, in my career, I've always followed my, you know, my energy and interests. And so on the one hand, that's meant that I've had a career that, you know, it involves uh, supporting uh, corporates, build startups um, in the UK and abroad. It then kind of jumps to uh, building a digital bank myself in East Africa. And now I'm over here in the in, in the Bay Area. And so at first look, you might kind of not really see these things um, fit together. But over time, I built a real uh, kind of uh, knowledge and excitement for a particular industry, which was fintech and financial services, and had the chance to just meet many, many um, entrepreneurs in in that space and learn a lot about uh, the space. And I think that combined with actually being an entrepreneur myself and then at Stanford, uh, spending a lot of time convening other entrepreneurs around Stanford, inviting successful entrepreneurs to come back um, and talk to people. Uh, it meant that I was sort of at, in the right place at the right time as they were looking for, you know, a new investing partner to join uh, join their team. Okay, excellent. And tell me about the story of your book. I think your, your book is very interesting. Most people do not write books at this stage of your career, uh, but I think your book has been very important uh, to your brand building and also to your ability to meet a lot of people in the fintech industry. So what caused you to write the book and how has it worked out? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, um, you know, the, the reason I initially um, st started kind of writing the book is I, I set myself a challenge. I've always been kind of a little more math and computer science orientated. Uh, and I wanted to kind of put myself to the challenge and see if I could actually actually write, having consumed so many other kind of startup um, startup books and stories and, and, you know, really dived into understanding like how different entrepreneurs build their, built their companies. Um, and so I put forward a, a proposal um, to a Financial Times competition called the Breckenbauer Prize for Young Authors. And my proposal for FinTech Wars ended up being shortlisted to my surprise, which sort of gave me a little bit of that momentum and validation of like, okay, there might be something in my idea. And then sort of fast forward, um, that was in 2022. What happened over the next 12 months is um, FTX collapsed, Silicon Valley Bank collapsed. Um, at the same time, um, you know, New Bank, uh, which is a public fintech company started by David Velez, a former uh, GSB, -er, um, you know, continued to go into strength and strength. And a lot of the themes and stories that I pointed out in my proposal actually came true. And so I thought there was just enough in there to um, to bring it to life. And actually, really, it was during your class that I did a lot of the interviews. I kind of got the confidence to just reach out to um, many of my mentor or you know, many of the people that I you know hoped in my wildest dreams would be my mentor or you know that I'd love the chance to talk to like David, um, like Reid Hoffman, uh, one of the PayPal mafias and the founder of LinkedIn, uh, Roloff Botha, who's a managing partner and steward of um, Sequoia, Martha Lane Fox, who founded lastminute.com in the UK. And so I just went through this process of, of just kind of reaching out to or meeting these people, you know, in person at different speaking events and um, kind of gathering their story, meeting them for an interview afterwards. And eventually I, I kind of had enough momentum and, and the book came together. Excellent. And I think, you know, I think as you tell that story, it reminds me very much of Jason Calacanis, um, who basically built his career, again, off of journalism. I think one of the interesting things about journalism is it gives you the opportunity uh, to reach out to people and ask them questions. And if smart people, you know, get asked questions by a smart person, at the end of the day, that smart person becomes much smarter. Yeah, and I, I think it's, um, it's uh, you know, actually, and, and doing your research as you do it. So I'd spent a, a lot of time, in fact, you know, with David from Nubank, his company was the inspiration behind starting a very similar company uh, that I did in East Africa. And so I just had that depth of knowledge that I could ask him intriguing questions about particular moments in the journey or product decisions. And I could actually relate um, to him, at least in, in some way, or maybe rather he could relate to me, that um, I think over time, the, the people that I ended up interviewing um, Certainly, I'm not their, you know, not their peer in terms of their success, but interacting with them as a peer with a real curiosity, like enabled us to actually really, really 
build rapport. And, you know, many of the interviews in my book have ended up kind of becoming my friends, like the, the founders of Venmo. Okay. And uh, you said you, you, your startup, you started a startup in, uh, in Kenya. Um, you are not Kenyan. Uh, so what caused you to be interested in starting a, a, a company in East Africa? Yeah, um, it's, it's a great question. Um, so I guess sort of, you know, if you kind of double click on my background a little closer, actually, my dad was born in uh, in Kenya and East Africa, and he was part of a wave of Indians that came from, or rather his, his parents and grandparents were, that came from uh, uh, Mumbai and from Goa to um, to places like Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania um, to work on the railway line, to uh, add kind of professionals to the industry. And so I've always had... Um, this kind of intrigue about that part of my background in India and also in in Kenya. And I think I had the chance growing up in the UK to see both how like banking and fintech is broken, but also how it, it you know can be really innovated on um, in places like uh, East Africa and Kenya, where there is um, a tool called M-Pesa that processes a lot of the payments of the whole country. And I think seeing the need and having some background and some root there um, enable me to kind of you know, that at least piqued my interest. And then I came together with um, some friends from university who are Kenyan. Um, and we kind of then formed a very, you know, a great team, uh, you know, of tech, of business, of, of local knowledge to actually build the startup. And so I'm going to ask you two inter interrelated questions. The first question is, and the question is about what you learned from this. So what did you learn from your research on fintech wars? And then I'm going to ask you, what did you learn from starting the bank? I think um, from uh, fintech wars, uh, the you know one of the biggest um, learnings was just around how kind of you know I, I particularly explored kind of how some of these unicorn founders um, responded to crisis, responded to their most difficult moments, and held themselves um, you know in 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 these situations. And I think, you know, one of the most interesting things that, that I saw is, number one, you know, very often, I think the very best founders are at their best in crisis. They love it when, you know, they're throwing the most difficult um, challenge. I come back from David, David from Nubank again. He's at his best when the central bank is about to tell him that uh, he's going to get shut down or that he's running out of money because he's then able to galvanize himself and every single person around him to take on that um to take on that challenge, you know, Reid Hoffman compares it to uh, sort of, you know, great startup operators being, you know, like doctors or, um, you know, emergency care workers. They're used to being in these high stressful environments. And so it was amazing to see how calm and how articulate um, how many of these people were faced with very, very difficult situations. And I think the thing for me that I saw that they do is that, you know, they break up the they respond with massive action but they often break up the stimulus to the response. And so, you know, they're hit with this huge challenge and they're able to sit with it, at least for a moment, and decide how they want to respond, decide the best path of action, um, and then make kind of very fast um, and decisive decision-making in response. And of course, you know, maybe that sounds generic, but seeing that in person, seeing it in the way people's eyes light up or their smiles or, um, you know, uh, it, it kind of it it kind of rubs rubs off on you, I'd say. So so that's at least the the book piece. And what about the what did you learn from the startup experience? Yeah, and I think I think in the in in the similar in a very different way. I think the the startup experience is just this constant journey of hitting your head against a brick wall, um, which is you know when you're trying to build something. And bring something into life, especially in a regulated industry like banking, um, there is just kind of far more hurdles than you would ever imagine or envision in the first place to getting started. Um, and I think that naivety, you know, just being very excited about a problem, that naivety and jumping in um, is quite a powerful thing, because if you realized everything that you needed to do, you probably wouldn't do it. You know, it took us two and a half, three years to actually launch. We certainly wouldn't have chosen banking if that, you know, at the very beginning. Um, if we knew that, but that ability to, you know, raise, you know, fundraising in COVID in East Africa from Silicon Valley investors um, to create a new kind of regulatory path that didn't exist in a country before um, to actually 
get Fingo, the company, off the ground to, you know, have the um, uh, kind of, you know, to, you know, I guess, you know, throw throw luck to the wind and invite the president to launch your product because you also think, you know, that they'll be supportive to the overall goals. And then that happened. You sort of, I at least learned this ability to, um, you know, if, uh, you know, as you call it, get out of my own way, because very often if you take some form of action, it probably isn't going to work out the way you expect. But I genuinely find that momentum is a lot better um, than not. And it will probably work out in in other different ways. And that was the same with the book. There were, you know, a whole set of people that I planned to reach out to and interview. And then in the end, you know, I I kind of just really ended up going for the interviews of people that I felt an affiliation, a connection, um, you know, had real knowledge of, even though they were kind of, you know, uh, you know Nigel Morris, the founder of Capital One's $50 billion company, the same for Nubank. I never would have expected to even be able to get in touch with these people, but having that authentic path or, you know, authentically reaching out to them, um, I think just, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, just taking action is, is probably what I learned from the startup. Hmm. So you really illustrate, I think, one of the things we try to teach in the class, which is you don't ask what you don't get for, or you don't get what you don't have, pardon me, you don't get what you don't ask for. Um, so if you don't ask, you never get anything. And I think you've been very bold in your ass. What other lessons have you used from the class or did, that you found useful from the class that either explains your experience or that you're going to use going forward? Mm-hmm. I think, um, you know, Actually, to flip that, um, that that don't ask, you don't get. I think one of the things that I kind of actually observed from the class, and um, it's actually so rare that people um, would offer as well. Um, so actually, when I, you know, meet interesting folks, the first thing I do, or, you know, the very last thing I do is, is, is offer, can I help you in in some way? And of course, I can't help them running their startup, but I can put them in front of a room of other Stanford students that they might find enjoyable or if they're looking to recruit in a certain area of their, their startup or business or share a certain message or connect to a professor, you know, being inside the Stanford ecosystem, it turns out there was a lot of things I could be helpful for and just switching that orientation to be the very first thing um, when I, you know, when, when I engage with um, uh, kind of different people, I found to be um, really, really powerful. And then I think the the, the other piece is um, break the break the rules, and I think you know that, that's also a little bit related to get out of your um, own way. But I think kind of for me, break the rules is a little bit you know more related to um, I think break kind of com- conventional norms. So uh, you know one you know isn't expected to kind of reach out to the CEOs of public companies. And you, you should, of course, do it in a very authentic way that is perhaps valuable to them as well. Um, but having the kind of, um, uh, you know, the con- not, not the confidence, but the, um, you know, at least taking a chance to, to do that or go and speak to um, people afterwards and then connecting um, with them on a human level. One of the, one of the speakers from the class, um, Lucinda, was, was going to Kenya a couple of months after uh, um, a- after the class. And so we connected around that. I gave her some some travel advice and that just organically formed a friendship afterwards. Now, we haven't worked together in other way, uh, any other ways, but just having um, kind of leaning in and just being yourself and, and offering value out, I think is a really powerful way to be. So you're talking about really the principle of generosity. Yeah. Which is, I think, extremely overlooked in networking. When people often try to build relationships, they think about, you know, what do I need from you as opposed to how can I be helpful to you? In what ways can I, you know, make your life better, give you information that you don't otherwise have? So I think that's a that's an interesting kind of it's a, a very interesting perspective. Um, you are so if I were to describe you in a word, the word I would use to describe you would be bold. I mean, you know, <laughs> it is <laughs> It's bold to write a book proposal. It's bold to do a startup. It's bold, um, you know, to basically begin your career at one of the leading venture capital firms as a partner. Um, So um, I want to end by asking you, where does that boldness come from? And how, and and in particular, how can other people build it? 
I mean, I, you know, we've, we've talked about, I think very appropriately, the principle of getting out of your own way and breaking the rules, which is in fact related. We've talked about the fact that you, what you don't ask for, you'll never get. Uh, but that all requires, I think, a boldness that not everybody has. So if you have any reflections on how you got it, or better yet, how other people can develop it, I'd, I'd like to hear. Yeah, I, I think maybe firstly on where it comes from, in a way, I'm sort of fortunate that I, I grew up in this, um, this city called Sheffield, where there really wasn't any tech businesses. Uh, I didn't know what venture capital was. I didn't know what management consulting was. Um, I uh, kind of barely knew anything about London or the financial industry either. And so I think in a way, at every stage of my kind of career or personal journey, uh, when I went to university, when I joined McKinsey, um, I spent a year at the University of Hong Kong um, and traveled a lot in Southeast Asia. I have just been kind of blown away by the kind of, um, you know, both the people that I got to spend time with and, and the learning. And I just totally kind of love learning and being an absolute sponge to all these different things and always kind of being a, a beginner learner. As I think, I think has meant that I still having that mentality when I got to um, Stanford or when I was building my company meant that I'm very willing to try um, to try new projects like writing a book or starting a company because I just approached it in the same way as going down to live in London and in you know both very intentionally but and with a lot of energy and okay to take kind of small failure along the way and so I think that the lesson or takeaway is just kind of knowing yourself well enough that I love learning. And so I don't see writing a book as work. It's it's fun for me to interact with all these people. And so the more you can flip um, in your career or in your life or in the way you build relationships to be um, around where you actually get your energy, I think you'll be very well served to just see what actually might come about that you totally don't expect and just lean into those um, lean into those things a lot. That's, I think, a, an interesting and important answer. And I think it's a nice way to end the podcast. Today, we've been talking to James Tacasa about his experience of writing a book, starting a fintech startup, becoming a partner at Andreessen Horowitz, and doing all kinds of amazing things. It's a really pr privilege to know you, James. Thank you so much for being, the, being on the Pfeffron Power podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be here as well to learn from you. Thank you.